In contrast to what is on the agenda, I'm going to talk about advanced HTTPS. Um, <laughs> as Tillman mentioned, um, I'm a senior security engineer at Mozilla. I'm also on the internet, so if you have any kind of questions, feel free to ask me after the talk or online. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk about TLS for the web. That means explicitly HTTPS. Um, that also means my talk is not going to be about getting to HTTPS. Um, though I admit that getting to HTTPS may be hard for some websites, um, but if you want to know more about deploying HTTPS on your website, there are some other good presentations like myth busting HTTPS from Emily Stark. Um, but you can also poke me after the talk and I have some cool tips. <laughs> um, so the assumption for this talk is that you're already on HTTPS and you kind of wonder what to do next. Um, I also assume that your website is already redirecting all HTTP traffic to HTTPS um, and that you're probably using HTTP strict transport security, which makes all browsers prefer HTTPS over HTTP. So what can we do beyond? Um, the goal for this talk is advanced HTTPS. That means thanks to HTTPS, we can stop worrying about men in the middle attacks. Um, before HTTPS, an attacker could just sit anywhere in the network um, and mess with the data, read data, etc. cetera. Um, thanks to HTTPS, we now worry about advanced man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, so an attacker has to sit in the network, but also have a way to subvert HTTPS. Um, and there are basically two main ways to do that. One is to break the cryptography, and the other one is to get a certificate. Um, I'm not going to really talk about breaking the cryptography. Um, for various reasons. One is I'm not a cryptographer. Um, <laughs> um, but let's briefly glance over attacking uh, attacks against the cryptography. Um, and let's take a very brief moment to reflect on TLS security. Um, these are all attacks on just the TLS protocol itself, um, which is leaving a lot of implementation specific bugs aside. Um, for example, heart bleed and go to fail. Um, and as someone who's deploying HTTPS said, there is only, there's only limited <laughs> amount of things you can do, um, where I assume that somebody who's deploying HTTPS is probably not a cryptographer, though I know that there are cryptographers in this audience. Um, so instead of deep, deep diving into the protocol or the cryptographic primitives, um, I would recommend looking into Mozilla uh, Mozilla's server-side um, TLS guidelines and um, the configuration generator. Um, the Mozilla server-side TLS guideline and the configuration generate, generator allows to pick between um, several types of configurations um, with different sets of compatibility levels, so to say. Um, the lowest tier is called old and aims for maximum compatibility, which actually includes um, support for Windows XP and Internet Explorer 6, which is a setup from 2001. That means uh, 16 years of compatibility. I certainly hope that your website doesn't need this. Um, so you can go with one of the other tiers. Um, intermediate goes back to Windows XP Service Pack 2, and um, that is from 2004. But almost all new websites probably want to talk with more modern browsers. Um, so the modern scheme um, rules out anything that is older than IE 11, Android 5, Java 8, and also disables TLS version 1, 1 1.1, and leaves only TLS version 1.2 and newer. It also disables DES, uh, triple DES, and uh, C in CBC mode and uh, SHA 1. So having talked about the cryptography itself, um, the remaining part of this um, presentation is going to be about the certificates. Um, I want to look at how people get certificates, how they are supposed to get certificates, and how attackers got them in the past. So this will be some sort of grab bag of vulnerabilities and countermeasures. Um, and we will start by looking at how people have got certificates in the past. Um, I suppose most of you know there are two types of certificates though that won't really matter for the rest of the talk. There are extended validation certificates, which come with a green company name or legal entity name in the address bar. And the certificate authority does some sort of legal entity checks, representation, 
etc. extra money, but that doesn't really affect the crypto or the security. Um, the other certificates are so-called domain validation certificates, and uh, the idea is that the certificate authority, from now on, by the way, I'm going to just I'm going to say CA instead of certificate authority. Um, the certificate authority um, is going to do some sort of domain validation step. That means um, you sort of have to prove that you own the domain that you're asking them to give you a certificate for. And um, how do they check that this domain is actually yours when you ask them to give you a certificate? Well, um, in the whole domain validation scheme, it's kind of like a challenge response protocol. So the admin tells the CA, hey, I want a certificate for example.com. And um, the CA says, well, if you want a certificate for example.com, try to put this number on the web page. And then the admin puts the number on the web page and clicks next. And then the CA checks the web page, finds the number, and gives a certificate to the administrator. Um, there are various ways to put something on the web page um, or the server. And um, one of those is via HTTP, where usually there is a very specific folder called dot well known slash PKI validation, where you're supposed to put the number. Um, the reason why it's dot well known slash PKI validation is that you usually wouldn't accidentally put something in a folder that is regard secret or invisible in Unix, which the preceding dot um, means. Um, there's also DNS-based domain validation. Um, so you basically put a TXT record in your DNS for your domain, and that says something like domain validation equals that sort of random number. Um, and then there's the email case in which you basically have to prove that you own the domain by receiving emails for one of many email addresses, for example, or actually exhaustively, admin, administrator, webmaster, hostmaster, postmaster at example.com, or any of the email addresses in the whois information under technical contact, administrative contact, or registrant. Um, so let's think about how would we attack domain validation. Um, it's probably unlikely that an attacker would be able to upload something on your server under dot well known <coughs> slash PKI validation. It's also probably unlikely that somebody would be able to change your DNS TXT records, although we'll get to that in a bit. Um, but something that seems relatively easy is getting getting some, some sort of access to email addresses for arbitrary usernames, especially, for example, for, well, email providers. Um, and uh, I have a quick demo, real-world uh, example. For example, um, disposable email providers. Um, so what if we would try those and uh, they happen to allow a lot of usernames for disposable email addresses? Well, as it so happens, there are some disposable email providers that give you a mailbox for one of those, so to say, privileged uh, usernames. And as it so happens, there are also CAs that um, wouldn't mind doing that. So as it so happens, I um, got a certificate for one of those disposable email address providers. And um, a tiny reminder, though, this uh, specific certificate that I, uh, authority that I looked at isn't really widely trusted. So, um, so maybe this whole kind of weird domain validation scheme thing um, needs some sort of standard or standardization or some sort of, um, yeah, some s something more specified than you just do something with a domain and then somebody figures out that it's probably your domain and then here you get a certificate. Um, uh, the fine folks behind Let's Encrypt have drafted an IETF standard called ACME, which stands for Automated um, Certificate Management Environment. And it sort of works the same way that the previous schemes I've shown you work. Um, so I'm briefly going to repeat this again. Um, in the Let's Encrypt case, uh, I think, which is, which is a big win, um, the server admin is not actually an admin, but a server software because, well, computers can very well talk to each other. Um, so you say, hey, I want a certificate for example.com. Um, they ask you to put a number on your server, and then 
you put the number on your server and you give them, you generate a key pair and sign a number for them with the key pair and give them the public key so they know this specific public key and whoever has access to the private key corresponding to the public key um, is now entitled to do stuff for example.com. Um, also briefly, I wanted to, as I mentioned, um, come back to DNS-based domain validation. Um, I did say it's somewhat unlikely. Um, I did so, first of all, because even though I know that DNS is a UDP-based protocol and there could be some sort of risk for spoofing a man in the middle, um, all the domain validation code that I've looked at, um, <laughs> for example, for Let's Encrypt, um, actually use DNS over TCP, so uh, the risk is somewhat limited. Um, another point, though, is that uh, DNS validation in the ACME case, um, once the response token not on the, in a TXT record for example.com, but for underscore dash uh, validation dot example.com, um, which uh, brought me to the idea of looking at dynamic DNS providers. Um, as it so happens, uh, some of them allow arbitrary subdomains and even TXT records. Um, and as it so happens, I managed to get certificates for dynamic DNS providers. Um, actually, I just set up the certificate and then realized I should probably report it. Um, but for what it's worth, um, underscore domain subdomains are also important for other kind of important stuff, so it's not a really good idea to allow that. Um, but yeah, if you really care about your domain, um, you should probably know these things and figure out that um, blacklists are hard and do some exhaustive research instead of just like blocking admin or blocking certain things. Um, I realize I'm way too fast, um, sorry. But um, despite all these examples, what can we do to actually prevent misissued certificates? Um, so first of all, yes, we'd probably avoid domain validation problems, and I suppose that most people in the audience don't um, run a dynamic DNS service or provide email addresses for anyone in the internet. Um, so that's kind of soft. Um, so, but maybe we would also like to disallow CAs from just issuing certificates for our specific domain, except for the CA that we're actually having, doing business with. Um, and maybe we would also like to actually stop clients from connecting to our website when the certificate is somewhat weird, unexpected, or incorrect. Um, and there are solutions to these problems. First of all, um, there is a thing called um, DNS CAA records. This means Certificate Authority um, Authorization, I think. Um, and the idea is that a DNS record in your domain name actually tells you which CAs are supposed to issue certificates for your domain. Um, the format is relatively simple. The first number is basically a bit mask. If the seventh bit is set, it means enforce this thing, and if not, then it's not enforcing, but just, um, just issuing anyway. And there are certain commands like issue, or there's also issue wild for issuing wildcards, where you say which CAs are supposed to create certificates for your domain, and then you can set up some sort of reporting, which is behind the IO dev um, command. And then if a CA actually tries to create a certificate, they also, despite all this domain validation thing, look into the DNS records. Um, and if they see they are not actually allowed according to the CAA records, they would stop doing that and report. Um, one might now think, well, that's good enough for like mistakes in CAs, but that still gives us, the, gives us the problem that CAs can still technically do that if there is like a bug in, I don't know, their CAA code or if they are compromised or whatever. So um, on the upside, um, CAA is going to be mandatory starting as far as I understand September this year. So um, every CAA that is widely trusted will have to implement this um, and have it running in September. The other thing I mentioned briefly is um, controlling the clients upon connection, which boils down to key pinning, of course. Um, and there is an ITF standard called um, HPKP, which stands for HTTP Public Key Pinning. And that basically lives behind an HTTP header where the website just says, well, 
you know, pin this specific key. So the pin is not for the certificate actually, but it's for the public key within the certificate. Um, and you give the header a lifetime and you may or may not include subdomains for your domain. Um, though there is of course a risk of lockout, right? If you lose or want to change your key or have to revoke a certificate and you really just pinned your one certificate that you know exists, then users won't be able to connect to your website, obviously. So it is not a great idea to just pin one end entity certificate, that means um, a specific cert certificate um, on the leaf of the trusted root um, of the PKI, sorry, but rather um, have some sort of backup strategy as in like multiple certificates, maybe from various CAs, maybe with different keys, and you pin all of those, and the, and the backup one is actually somewhere, somewhere protected, and if something goes wrong, you can just roll over without breaking all the clients. Um, also, we recently learned that certificate authorities, authorities can actually become distrusted in browsers, so just putting all eggs in one basket in general isn't a very good idea. Um, and then there's something that I also wanted to briefly mention um, called Certificate Transparency. There was a very nice presentation by Martin Schmiedecker at 33rd um, Chaos Communication Congress, so we'll really only glance over it. Um, but the idea is that all certificate authorities um, submit a signed proof of the certificates they issued to a public log. Um, the signatures are called um, signed certificate timestamps. And those public logs are append-only, distributed, and that makes all the PKI ecosystem auditable. Um, and they are append-only and cryptographically verifiable because they're Merkle hash trees, also something that I will only glance over, um, but happy to explain during coffee. Um, those SETs can be embedded in the certificate itself or in a TLS handshake, so there's actually a way to, to check those things live and wonder if this is like a legitimate certificate that other people may have also seen in the wild. Um, while this is already mandatory for extended validation certificates, it's hopefully going to become mandatory for all um, certificates, and um, that means there's obviously software that you can run to crawl these logs and figure out if someone else issued certificates for your domain. Um, but on top of that, there are also public services that you can use to spot or get alerts for certificates for specified domains, uh, notably one called Cert Spotter and the other one with a brief name called Facebook Certificate Transparency Monitoring Developer Tool. Um, and uh, by the way, for the certificate that I created on uh, Tuesday for this disposable email provider, it actually has SCT information embedded into the certificate I got. Unfortunately, the log ID, which points to the, um, I should probably use my mouse. The log ID in the SCT points to a specific log that is supposed to have received um, the signed certificate timestamp, but this log ID has never been seen on the internet, actually. Um, having talked to customer support, they said that um, it's a private log. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, that being said, uh, the CA that I worked with <laughs> um, isn't really widely trusted anymore. So um, it was still kind of funny when, when they said, well, um, we do store them all in a database. Which database? <laughs> well, they're private. OK. Anyway, um, moving on, the takeaways are um, Previously, just a few years ago, a compromised or misbehaving CA, and there have been numerous examples, um, were kind of like a doomsday scenario and we wouldn't really know what to do. Um, but nowadays we can actually prevent fraudulent certificates from being issues, issued. We can de detect misissued certificates. And if you were willing to take some risks and have some good backup strategies, we can also pin certificates. Um, that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Big shout out to the people at Rusac for giving a, um, running a non-profit um, security conference.